This is the Seahawkers podcast, episode 417. I'm Brandon Schultz of the Military Seahawkers, and joining me is my good buddy and Montana Seahawker, Adam Emmert. It's always a fun week to join you, man. The week coming out of a bye, because you always have such high spirits and high hopes, and the idea of the Seahawks getting healthy coming up here for week six, that's exciting. We've got the big matchup with the Bengals to talk about, man. Uh, I don't know how much more Giants you want to get into, man, but this could be a fun show. I, I'm I'm lit up for this. And I mean, not just fired up, lit up. Uh, I'm going to start drinking some beers. <laughs> it's especially nice coming out of a bye week when you have one going into the bye week, because I think it would have a completely different feeling, say, if the Seahawks would have lost to the Giants in some kind of tragic fashion and then go into the bye week, then you're two and two. I mean, the, the other thing that makes this so much better is not only do are we still coming off of a victory, we got to watch two NFC West rivals lose this weekend and a, uh, a Niners team that beat the Cowboys, which I it's one of those games where you don't really care who wins because you just dislike both teams. I do dislike both teams immensely, but uh, I I much rather would have seen the Niners lose, or at least it would have been amazing if they had been destroyed like the Cowboys were. But uh, no, uh, Niners look good. We'll talk about that later, I guess, if we have to. Um, Catfish! I'm still, geez. Yeah, yeah, I have some thoughts for sure. You you definitely would prefer. Yeah, this weekend would have been even better if all of the NFC West teams lost. I, I guess I didn't have that expectation, so no. I, I'm not disappointed in that sort of way. Try not to worry about those other teams this weekend. I took a little bit of a football hiatus this weekend. It was nice, but again, fired up to get back into it this week, man. Seahawks win the bye week. They did win the bye week, but taking a football hiatus, uh, there was an opportunity here with the Cincinnati Bengals, the team that the Seahawks are facing coming up on Sunday playing an NFC West rival in the Arizona Cardinals. This was a matchup that it felt like if you're going to watch any game on the bye week weekend, this would be the one. I mean, I watched it. I just didn't watch it on Sunday. (laughs) Right. Well, that's fine. But I think for those who were going to sit down and watch a game of all the games being played, this is the, would be the one as a Seahawks fan that I'd choose because yeah, you can scout an opponent. And at the same time you can cheer on, uh, a loss. I think it was probably better for the Bengals to win in a couple regards. One, because they're playing a division rival in the Arizona Cardinals. But two, I think the Bengals have played their best this season when their back is up against a wall. Like, oh, if they lose this one, then you better watch out. And that's what happened when they were 0 2 and going into week three. And then now when they were 1 and 3 going into week five, they it, it felt like they needed that win. And so now they're in a position they don't have to win back home in week six. Well, I mean, they still are must win territory here, but they seem to play their best when they're playing the NFC West. Both of their wins have been against the Rams and the Cardinals in that's a little spooky. The other thing that's a little spooky after watching that Cardinals game, Brandon, is that Joe Burrow, he was moving around and he looked pretty decent. And then Jamar Chase looked otherworldly. I mean, that dude is a freaking baller. He is amazing. 192 yards receiving on 15 catches, including three touchdowns. Yeah, that was a, a heck of a day for Chase. And you're not wrong about Burrow. It seems like he's finally getting healthy because he he struggled, I think, to really step into throws through the first few weeks of the season. And now he's got a little bit of mobility. Obviously, he has that connection with Chase. This is going to be one of the more fascinating matchups, whereas I think we knew going into the season, those first four games were going to be tough because you looked at it as the Seahawks won their defensive line facing teams that generally you would expect to favor the run. And now we're getting into a, a, a team with Tyler Boyd, Jamar Chase. I mean, they they have those receiving weapons that now you have to worry about and with the Seahawks secondary coming together. It it just, it makes that part a little more fascinating. Yeah. There's a lot of just crazy matchups in this game. You talk about the first four weeks and thinking going into it, it was going to be tough. I didn't, I didn't, I I thought the Rams stunk. I thought the lines were real good. 
I thought the Panthers would stink. And I thought the Giants would stink. Like oh, everybody's I like, thought oh, that those teams would left. stink, but I thought that the Seahawks, based off of their run defense last year, would have challenges against those teams being predominantly run teams. And so that's where my concern was, is that could they stop the run against these teams that you are expecting to run the ball against you? And I wasn't so sure now that they've gone through those first four games, I do feel better about the, their ability to stop the run, their ability to stop the pass though. That was challenged through those weeks. And here it is another big challenge, perhaps their biggest challenge outside of the week one game against Matt Stafford at full strength. Yeah, that was going to be a huge challenge just because, like you said, uh, Stafford was going to be a full strength. We didn't know that Puka Nakua was going to be, you know, Jerry Rice and Tyreek Hill wrapped all into one, apparently, or something there. Yeah, but it didn't matter that Cooper Cup was out in that game. Exactly. But this this is a fun matchup through the air. And that has been the side of the ball that the Seahawks have struggled more on defensively. They've been very consistent stopping the run. And to your point, Brandon, like they did a great job through those first four weeks playing good run defense. And I'm not sure the Cardinals are a great running team. I like Joe Mixon a lot. I think he's a heck of a back. He's very versatile, catches out of the backfield well. He's a tough runner. He's quick, all of that stuff. Their offensive line, though, is not great. I, I know that they made the big addition of uh, Orlando Brown Jr. In I don't know. I've watched two or three of their games this year. And Joe Burrow's been under duress. Yeah. And even in the Cardinals game, he was under duress quite a bit. Now, he was able to move around and make some plays here and there, but the Cardinals made their plays too. What I'm looking for in terms of stopping the pass, I mean, we can get to the receivers versus the corners here later on because I think in a lot of ways, that's what most people are most interested in. Mm -hmm. But in terms of up front, I want to see Clint Hurt dial it up to 12 again this week. I want to see that aggressive blitzing stunts style defense where they are getting after Joe Burrow because well, he is mobile. He's not the most mobile quarterback out there and you can get after him. And that's, if you want to get him off his game, that's what you have to do. And the Cardinals were able to do it to a degree. I don't know that the Seahawks will do what they did to the giants. I mean, that seems a bit of an anomaly, but if you can crank up the pressure again, I think that would be a huge, huge part of this game. Yeah, having an historic level of sacks and pressure is probably a little bit too much to ask. But, you know, if they could get close to that, that would be fine. And I know what you're saying, too, about the Cincinnati Bengals offensive line. It's been part of the reason why they've struggled on third down. Even against the Arizona Cardinals, they were 5 of 14 on third down. And if the Seahawks defense can hold them to that type of uh, production, then that could be one of the things that helps propel them on defense. I I think that part of the reason, though, too, is that the Bengals don't normally help themselves, or they haven't, at least through the first few weeks of the season, using Joe Mixon on early downs. They just, they haven't, and, and maybe part of it, too, is the offensive line and run blocking. They don't feel like they are quite in sync yet because, yeah, Mixon's not having a great year so far to start out the season. Not up to his usual standard right. or not even up to the Bengals usual standard that offense. The first uh, three, four weeks of the season looked disjointed out of sorts and was a dink and dunk type offense. They were not pushing the ball down the field at all. Uh, I think that pass to chase the, the deep one, like the six yarder or whatever it was, was one of their first of 20 plus yards in like two, three games or something along those lines. It would have been really a difficult uh, time for that Bengals offense. They were struggling and they're an offensive team, you know, as far as their identity goes, even though I highly respect their defense. I, I think their defense is darn good. It's going to be interesting to see what you get this week, because before the Cardinals game, if you would have said, how do you like the Seahawks chances in this game? It'd have been like, well, this year, this Bengals offense is completely out of sorts. They can't get anything going. They have no rhythm. Joe Burrow looks out of sorts, but they seem to put together a pretty nice game against the Cardinals, despite third down, which, boy, does that bode well for the Seahawks, man. That was a good stat by you pulling that. I mean, that's one of the things that I I look at with how good teams are on third down going up against the Seahawks, and the Seahawks defense hasn't been that great. So is it just that the Bengals tend to struggle on third down, or you know, have they faced good third down defenses? I, I don't think of Arizona being particularly good when I think of the Cincinnati defense now. 
this is the week that we sure be it sure would be nice to have healthy tackles. And oh, I think one of the questions is if you get Charles Cross back out there, does Jason Peters go over and play right tackle? Because it sounds like Pete Carroll is ready to get Peters out there and playing one of those spots with Trey Hendrickson on one side, Sam Hubbard on the other one. Those are positions that are going to be tested this week. And DJ Reader up the middle, uh, another fine player on the defensive line. I, I, like I said, I've watched two, three Bengals games this year. And then also in the past as well. And I'll tell you that Hendrickson kid, that dude's a game record. I mean, he may not be Max Crosby last night in the Monday night football game. Good, but he ain't far off. And if we don't have cross back and, you know, maybe we put Peters out there, maybe we don't. It did sound like Abe Lucas doesn't really have a shot for this week, but getting closer, we're going to need him because Hendrickson has been a, just a monster this year. Well, and BJ Hill, their other guy up the middle who used to play for the Giants, uh, been with Cincinnati here for this is his third year now. He had six pressures in the game against Arizona up the middle and has 14 on the year with two sacks. So uh, that entire defensive line has guys that can get to the quarterback. They absolutely do. And it's that part of their defense is what makes their pass defense good because their corners are delightfully average. Like everything (laughs) about them is very average. And so I'm sitting here thinking, man, if this offensive line can put together yet another solid performance despite the injuries and keep Gino somewhat upright. I think the offense can have a day through the air. Yeah. DJ Turner, one of their corners and cam Taylor Britt, who is probably the more below average of the two. I think he, he had like three missed tackles in that game against the Cardinals alone. And yeah, that would be kind of the guy that you, you might want to go toward, but yeah, either one probably doesn't matter too much. Yeah, it doesn't much matter. And you look at the game uh, against the Cardinals and you see a lot of times Dobbs had chances to push the ball down the field and hit some big shots down the field. And that's just not his game. That's not the type of quarterback he is. And maybe they just played him on all the shallow stuff and called it good. But um, it looks like the deep pass is there to be had against this Bengals defense. If you can keep those defensive lineman off your quarterback long enough to let those plays develop. Yeah. So that is the big question. Can you keep those guys off of them long enough? Or are you going to be doing a lot of short, quick throws out of the backfield? Something that the Seahawks haven't shown that they're super good at. So yeah, that's, that's a question we're going to have and we'll just have to wait and see, I suppose. Unless you have a time machine and you can go and uh, figure it out ahead of time, come back and let us know. But yeah, yeah, that's to me that, Right there, that's the crux of the game is Seahawks offensive line and Bengals defensive line. I think this is going to be closer to a shootout than it is a low scoring affair. Just because I imagine if you think about the Bengals over the past couple of years and Joe Burrow and that offense with Chase and T Higgins and Tyler Boyd in, in mix in traditionally, they have been a very good high powered offense and they have you know hung points on just about everybody. I would guess that the beginning of this year, those first four weeks was more the anomaly than their week five performance against the Cardinals. If I were betting on it. Here's the thing about the Cincinnati Bengals defense. And I think if you're only watching this game against Arizona, wondering how they play against the run, Arizona, not really able to get going. Connor was injured. The Cincinnati Bengals are the second worst in terms of yards given up in the NFL this year. 154 average rushing yards given up, second only to Denver's 187 yards, and just behind the New York Giants at 151 yards per game average. So as good as they are as a pass rushing team, this is a team you might want to hammer the rock against. I did not realize that that's where they ranked against the run. I I mean, just watching them against the cards and against the Rams, it was like, well, okay. I mean, they were fine against the run. They weren't nothing to write home about, but they were fine. Man, to be that you said they were worse or better than the Broncos, just or just barely better than the Broncos. And they they're gave better, up what, they're, well, they're significantly better than the Broncos because the Broncos are like 30 yards per game worse. Yeah, but they also gave up 350 yards in one game. Right. Yeah. Yeah. On the ground. So 
Man, yeah, that would be pretty cool if the Seahawks can go out and establish a run and get Ken Walker going because, well, Ken's been good. It It's not like we've had that one performance where you're like, wow, that was a Ken Walker game. They, he really carried the load. That was, you know, just outstanding by him. He's had a couple of great plays and he's been fairly steady, but it'd be nice to see him get off for a game. And that would take so much pressure off of the offensive line in terms of keeping Gino upright, no doubt. Yeah, 206 yards given up to the Browns in week one, 178 given up to the Ravens, and then 173 to the Titans. Well, those are all good rushing teams. Those are good rushing teams, but I think that the Seahawks could be a, a good rushing team too. Well, they haven't shown it yet. They haven't shown that they're on that level no. as a running running team, but they, they have definitely relied more on Gino in the passing game, which I'm fine with. They've been very efficient at it. And obviously Gino's so darn consistent that you can hang your hat on that despite a rough outing against the giants. And I, I haven't seen this offense really struggle mightily for two games in a row since Gino has been at the helm. Like if they do have one of those games where it doesn't go quite the way that you would think it would, Usually they bounce back the next week and look pretty darn good. I expect the same from Gino. Sounds like his knee is just fine. Yeah, Pete was pretty clear about uh, emphasizing that in this press conference, or he just blew right over it and said he's fine and and moved on. Uh, it didn't seem like there was all that much discussion about it. No, uh, kind of like, yep, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Now, he did say that there's like DK is still going to be hurting. He's going to be hurting for a while. Right. Um, you know, went down the list of all the different guys, but I think, when it comes to the injury front, maybe the most exciting thing about this game, Brandon, is that we're going to see the Seahawks secondary whole for this game. It sounds like <laughs> Jamal's going to clear a concussion protocol tomorrow. Trey Brown has been back at practice. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about Kobe yet, but who cares? <laughs> and, uh, you know, Witherspoon and uh, Tariq out there. Those are the types of dudes that you're going to need to contain somebody like Jamar Chase, who, they take and move all over the formation, run them in motion, just like they do with like Tyreek down there in Miami. It, they have all sorts of ways that they find to get the ball to Jamar. So you're going to need a litany of dudes who are straight up ballers. Um, I think we have those guys in the secondary. I'd be curious to see who they decide to pick on. If it is, however they decide to roll it out there, whether it's in nickel and you have Jamal Adams and Witherspoon and reek uh the two outside players with with jamal inside or if you end up playing you know trey brown with you know, who are they going to have is it going to be trey brown out there is it going to be mike jackson out there and which one of those guys because that's going to be the spot yeah or shoot you know maybe they keep trying to pick on witherspoon even after the giants game with him being a rookie it, maybe maybe they keep do testing it. it i don't know yeah <laughs> please do they give it, give the man a shot because since Reek has been back and healthy, that side of the field has just been not tested. Yeah. Cause like, have you even just, heard that's... his name called in the game? Barely. They've Barely. only thrown it out there a couple times. And usually it's like a quick hitch underneath or something like that. That's it. They're giving Reek no shots. So I, I feel pretty confident that they're not going to throw it. Reek. If you want to throw out the rook, please be my guest. Do it all day. I, I'll take the pick. I'll take the pick. Yeah. And I would be surprised if they don't put spoon in the slot quite a bit after this last game against the giants, just because of the way it puts him in proximity towards the ball and then put Trey Brown on the outside. Cause I do think they like Trey a little bit more than Mike Jackson. Yeah. And do they play then Jamal Moore as that weak side linebacker spot? Uh, but if that's yeah. the position that you'd be taking off then normally to when you're going into nickel. So I'm just, I'm not sure how that's going to work. No, no, you take one of the, I mean, you take, well, let's see, I mean, in the three, four, I, I don't know how you want to say that. Yeah, I guess you would take one of the linebackers out there. Um, I, I would imagine that you're going to play Jamal a little bit in the honey badger role. And I guess the other way that you could make it work then potentially is taking Julian Love off the field, having Jamal on there, and then he's more of the box safety. And then, yes. and then you have both Jamal and uh, Devin both playing in the box. I love it. That sounds like a dangerous place to be as an opponent. <laughs> I'm just having a hard time trying to fit everybody into the box. That, that's exactly right. I get it. And uh, because it's exciting, there's so much dang talent back there and to see it finally come together, especially with 
Clint Hurt seemingly finding his groove, this defense finding their groove in terms of their fits and communication and things of that nature. KJ did a cool breakdown on his podcast, KJ All Day, uh, kind of going through a few of the plays and how they got to the quarterback as much as they did against the Giants. And some of it was some ineptitude by Giants offensive linemen, no doubt about it. But also, too, the scheme was pretty darn good. And guys were just doing their job. One of the things that KJ pointed out was, you know, different guys, whether it was Daryl Taylor or Nuosu or whoever, you know, taking on different guys and, you know, trying to bring them to different areas of the field so Spoon could get off on an edge blitz or, you know, B-Wag could come up the middle or whatever it was. And they all were working together fairly seamlessly. And I don't really have a, a sense yet for how Witherspoon is as a guy, but just the energy that I, I feel that he brings in these first couple of games that we've seen him, it, it does feel a little more electric and, and it's a different kind of energy than, I mean, I, I just think of like Reek and Bobby and Quandre as like laid back, chill guys that bring it on the football field. But they're also that you need to have like a little bit different kind of energy too that uh, that that fires people up on the defense and gets them going. And I, I think of guys like Earl that had that and and Sherman that had that. And and so I'm hoping that that Devin has a little bit more of that kind of energy. Oh, I think it's absolutely clear at this point. I mean, he's the guy with the juice. And then the thing is, is that you're getting the other guy that brings all the juice back. Finally here with Jamal and yeah. that's a big lift to this defense, not to mention just the way that this defensive line has played the last couple of weeks. They've been playing with their hair on fire in, you know, I think you have to say Jared Reed is one of those guys that brings that kind of energy. He has been the spark plug for the defensive line, just a revelation in terms of just Seeing what it looked like to have a defensive tackle who plays at a high level compared to what we had suffered through the last couple of years. And that's no uh, shot at thigh arms at all. Like, I mean, I love me some Al Woods, but it's just a different animal there with Jaron Reed. Yeah. And I think Reed too, then having that perspective of, of being there, going away, coming back. And he's definitely one of the names of that you hear of guys in the locker room having a lot of respect for. So I think he does provide a little bit of that juice uh, toward the middle, of that interior of the defensive line. And, and that can be infectious for the rest of the team too, especially when he's making plays on big downs. Big time. And with his pressure up the middle, it kind of makes up for the fact that Draymond hasn't been quite as consistent there as maybe we hoped, or as much of a difference maker, at least right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. So that helps mask that, but it's also been helping to get, Mafe off and to get uh Nuosu free for, for his opportunities. Just it's been it's been neat to watch it all come together when I know personally I had so many doubts that they were gonna actually finally figure out defensive line things. And let's not forget Mario Edwards Jr., man. That guy's been a very good football player yeah. since he's suited up as a Seahawk. I I I remember uh EJ and Brett like kind of making fun of us with uh, him being on the field be like, ah, that's the last time you'll remember seeing him or something along those lines. And I was like, Oh, well, okay. Well, that's kind of a bummer because I didn't follow his career closely or anything. Uh, he's been a heck of an addition. Well, you could make the argument that Edwards has been a bigger addition than Draymond has. You certainly could in at least through you know, four games in a bye week And you brought up boy, Mafe, Brady Henderson, posted about uh, Mafe's pass rush win rate, 34.8%, which ranks second uh, in the numbers that ESPN has come up with, behind Micah Parsons. He is number two behind Micah Parsons in pass rush win rate for this season so far. I think that Micah Parsons guy is pretty good. I've heard he's good. Yeah. And, I, so, and around that, draft time, we talk about, hey, if we could find a guy like Micah Parsons to go on this defensive line, we'd be all right. Turns out, maybe we got him last year in the second round of the draft. Yeah, it's been amazing to watch Boye's second year emergence here. We talked about it all offseason, the idea of the sophomore jump instead of the sophomore slump. And I just want to thank Boye Mafe personally for proving us right. That, that feels real good. <laughs> and it's looked awesome on the field as well. man. It's uh, 
I'm guardedly excited about this defense going into this game against a high-flying Bengals offense that I know has struggled for the majority of the year. But I do believe that they're a team that can get it together. I respect Zach Taylor as a coach. He's a good offensive mind. I just think that, man, I think they're getting it together here to make this run down the stretch of the season. And let's get it started. Let's get it kicked off against the stupid Bengals. Well, you could look at it, too, and say, hey, if the Bengals are starting to get healthy and looking better at this point in the season, it gives you a better measuring stick going forward. If you can get this win, you're liking your chances and even more fired up for when the stretch comes up when you're playing the Niners and the Cowboys who got destroyed and the Eagles who are still undefeated. You can start thinking ahead to, okay, this is one measuring point, and now we're going to have these other future measuring stick games coming up before getting into December and late in the season when you start thinking about playoffs. Yeah, okay, it's a little bit early to be thinking about playoffs, but at three and one nope. coming out of the bye, these are the start of the, th- these, these are the things that you get excited about. That's right. You're feeling about seven wins from the playoffs, right? So yeah, yeah it's time to start thinking playoffs. A quarter of the season's gone. Heck yeah, man. I think uh, there are two things that are contradictory here that both have me excited and a little scared for this game. One is, that the Seahawks continue to be freaking money when they go east of the Mississippi at that one Eastern time kickoff. I think they're what, 15 and one. Uh, That's been pretty outstanding. But then conversely, I think it's been the last three years in a row that we have lost coming off the bye week. Something's got to give. Something's got to give in terms of our history. Yeah. 15 of the last 18 games won at that 10 a.m. start time. And it makes me curious about the Bengals history. This is a team that they don't tend to play a lot against either. They did win most recently in 2019. That was at home 21, 20. Wasn't that the season opener? Uh, yeah, that would have been the season opener, wouldn't it? Yeah. I think September so. 8th. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're okay. right. And then the last time they went to Cincinnati was 2015. So that's LOB era. And they lost in overtime. And then they lost before that. So just one win out of the last three appearances where Coach Carroll has faced the Bengals. And that almost feels like three different iterations of both teams at this point, too, with that amount of time that's passed. Yeah, the 2011 team, the 2015 team, and the 2019 team. Very, very different teams in each case. 100%. Any other matchups that you want to talk about here in this game coming up against the Bengals? I don't have a lot off the top of my head because some of it again is we don't see them very often. No. So I don't have a, a huge uh, repertoire of things to draw off of in terms of these two teams, these two coaches uh, matching up against one another. I guess one of the things that I am interested in seeing is this last game, Joe Burrow had himself a day. The bank, Jamar chase went off Bengals scored 34, all that stuff. You know how many completions were to the tight ends? Not a lot, if any, right? Zero. Zero. <laughs> Zero? Not w- yeah, I think they targeted Irv Smith once. Wow. Yeah. Okay, that's a little surprising. Uh, T. Higgins is the other guy who com- who potentially who is coming off injury in time for this game. All right, great. I hope he plays. He st- I-, I-, I am not a T. Higgins guy. He's fine. I-, I think that's one of the more wildly overrated receivers in this league by a lot. If you want to know how I feel about T Higgins, go back and watch him against the Rams. Just watch that game and tell me what you think. What do you mean overrated? Do, do people think of him as like a top 20 receiver in the league? A lot of people, when they were talking best receiver trios or tandems in the league, like it's him and chase get tossed around all the time. Yeah. I think that's just because of how good chase is though. And better. But then again, I, I had people telling me that, uh, they thought T Higgins was a better receiver than Tyler Lockett because I don't know, apparently their mom put their belly in their microwave when they were children. Like <laughs> that's just how screwed up they are in the head that they would even think that. I don't even know how, if you're a, a yardist, uh, it, how you would get that T Higgins is better than Tyler Lockett because yeah. Okay. He's gotten over a thousand yards the last couple seasons, but that's because he has Joe Burrow throwing him the football. <laughs> I, there's that. And then you have Jar- Jamar Chase taking all the pressure off of them with everything that he does out there on the field. Okay. Now I can see why you would get your feathers ruffled then, especially if you saw ranking at some point 
that showed uh, wide receiver duos with those two ranked ahead of DK and Tyler. That, I could see how that could bother you. It does bother me because it's freaking wrong. It's well, wrong. Yeah, I, I don't know. What, <laughs> show yeah. me this list of where who put those two above our guys. Well, we can go back and look through one of our shows because we covered it uh, this offseason. I, I think we even had Clinton on uh, for that one. I think I've blocked it from my memory because I probably thought it was just some nincompoop writer that was coming up with stuff. Probably the same guy who gave the Seahawks an F grade in their 2012 draft. Yeah, that, that feels right. All right. Well, I am done talking about the Bengals. I want to talk about some of our NFC West rivals. Adam, let's do that coming up after the break. I got to say, Adam, it, it kind of feels weird throwing to break this early. But, you know, it also feels kind of weird recording in the evening and knowing that you're up in the mountains and not seeing your breath while we're recording the show. Yeah, uh, I decided that maybe the torture that I've been enduring that is self-inflicted uh, for the past uh, year since we've been doing it here out of the hobo shack uh, needed to end. I actually took our little... Uh, well tent stove that I had bought a long time ago uh, and installed it in here. I am snug as a bug in a rug. I am as happy as a clam. I, I'm loving this, dude. It is nice to be warm while podcasting. I bet you my attitude's even been better because of it. You know, it has. I mean, I think, well, for one, we didn't, I don't know of any technical difficulties that you had early on. Maybe, maybe you did have some and you were able to work through them so much easier because you were uh, already warm in the shack. So, yeah, it, it's been great. Yeah, a lot easier to work through a technical difficulty when you can feel the tips of your fingers. It's amazing. Well, I'm glad you're comfy there in the hobo shack, sipping on a seltzer. Think, things are good. Bye week victory. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's going great. We And, you know, we got to watch the Rams lose, which was also a bonus. It's always a bonus to watch the Rams go down. That was fun. Um, man, I wish the Niners would have gone down as well, but apparently Brock Purdy is um, incapable of making mistakes ever. I'll say it again. It's annoying how good the San Francisco 49ers are. The one question that I do have about this Niners team, they play with an intensity that I wonder if they can keep that up for a full season of football. Yeah, that's uh, that sounds like a fan grasping for straws. I like it. I don't think they can. They they're gonna they're gonna run out. I guess. But really, I guess the thing that's uh, almost as annoying is just how healthy that they've been throughout this year. Uh -huh. Not that I'm rooting for dudes to get injured by any stretch of the imagination, but yeah, give it a when, few weeks and I'll start. Yeah, when, when when teams like yourself, you know, here as the Seahawks fans, like go through all the injuries that they've gone through here early, to watch them just like cruise through, like you know. I don't know. The football gods have blessed them with this amazing season this year so far. But then again, here's the fun part to think about, Brandon, if you're a real sadist like me, is uh, that all of the success early for the Niners, that's not when you want to have it. You want to have all this big success towards the end of the year. They're they're burning out on all of this uh, really high level football early in the year. And so when it all comes crashing down towards the end of the season, it's going to be that much of a bigger gut punch for every Santa Clara fan. And it's going to feel oh so satisfying. Yeah. And you're just making fun of me for wondering if yes. they can keep up intensity. So, yeah, it's just another another uh, view through the uh, kaleidoscope of fan hopes. Hypocrisy? <laughs> yeah. Right. A hundred percent. Yeah. I'm, I'm a giant sitting hypocrite right now. Yes. The other thing that you can root for is for them to go undefeated and then to beat the team that takes them down on Thanksgiving and hand them their first loss. That would be fun, too. Sure. I don't care what number of loss it is when we beat them on Thanksgiving. I'm going to love that no matter what. It is shaping up to be a, a pretty big match coming up. It does feel like the Eagles and Niners, though, are in a different tier in terms of the NFC right now. Not the Eagles. And it's kind of the Eagles. I mean, okay. I, look, their record looks nice, and I know they went to the Super Bowl last year. They have not looked very coherent throughout the season here so far. Yeah, and they've still you know, beat every team in front of them. Sure, and that's fine. I mean, a win's a win and all that stuff, but 
when you're comparing them with the way the Niners have been winning here oh, yeah. early on in the year, like there's no comparison. There's no comparison. And, and that's why it's saying it's, it's fine if you want to put them in their own separate tiers in the tiers of the NFC, but they're still above the rest in, in terms of, of what I'm seeing. Yeah. In terms of record at this point of the year. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I, I'm not putting both those teams above the Seahawks right now. Not doing it. Just one. You're just putting one. Yeah. We've lost one more whole game. Jeez. We must be way more terrible than them. Hey, give us our full complement of dudes on the offense too, along with Jamal Adams on the defense and a full healthy season for the rest of the year. And let's see what happens. Yeah. I, I like our chances a lot. Somebody's got to win this division and why not our Seahawks? Yeah, why not us to pull out an old Russ uh, cliche? Well, there's a. I guess we did talk a little bit about the Arizona Cardinals already, so maybe we could move on to the Denver Broncos lost to the Jets. Um, you know, I've I've been trying to avoid rooting against the Broncos. I can't help myself. It's just because they're the Broncos. I get it. I get it. It's uh, fun to do. I've been. Um, Having less joy in it uh, now that I know that Jared's pretty much checked out on his fandom for the year, uh, so it doesn't uh, doesn't carry quite as much joy as it used to. But uh, yeah, I uh, the thing is, is that it's not a Russ problem. Which then now I feel actually pretty good about rooting against him because I want Russ to do well personally, and I yeah. want the Broncos to stink. They've been doing that pretty well, and really, my new. Huckleberry in terms of people to root against on the Broncos has been Sean Payton. And he got uh, a face full of crow when his, the former coach of the Broncos as offensive coordinator for the jets got the win over the Broncos in, in their house this weekend. Yeah. Bizarro Hackett with his uh, bond villain goatee gets the win, man. Karma is a bitch. <laughs> it's so good when uh, it works out in your favor though. Well, that's why you try to put out good karma. So it always works in your favor. Sean Payton forgot that. He also forgot the top of his hat still. He's still wearing hobo hats. You know, if Sean Payton were to switch to normal hats, would yeah. you, would, would that gain some sort of favor with you? Um, yeah. Yeah. That go it a would long show way. That he has more taste than just in his mouth. That's all yeah. you got to do to get Adam on board, switch over to the regular hat, drop the hobo hat and you're fine. Adam Emmert, pro hobo shack, anti hobo hat. Yeah, exactly. You know, live simple, but you know, pay for a full hat. Don't be cheap. But thinking about Broncos things here just for a second, Brandon. Yeah. They offload Randy Gregory onto the Niners. Oh my god. Does that gosh. move the needle of uh for you at all regarding the Niners? Or is that like a oh crap, that's an over the top move for sure? Or how how do you feel about that? Well, I guess when the guy that they get rid of is Kerry Hyder, I think that it, they have to have improved if they're dropping Hyder from the team and getting Gregory. So, yeah, I, don't know, it, I guess it bugs me in the sense that, yeah, Gregory could have gone anywhere. But again, he goes to the Niners. I think at this point in Randy Gregory's career, I think, you know, Hyder to Gregory is a lateral move. I, I don't know that that was a big deal at all. Maybe. Ask any Broncos fan about Randy Gregory. Let let, uh, let them tell you about what they think. <laughs> they're they're not, not big uh, fans. Not real. Okay. Well, maybe he can be the guy who goes in there and he's such a locker room cancer, but somehow yes. he he's able to Jedi mind trick them into keeping him on the team. And he just slowly eats away like a cancer to that defense from inside the locker room. And they go from being the uh, five win team that they are to a six and 11 team. And it manifests itself. It, like remember the preseason, we talked about the, what was that one group that had the, the Niners down as a six and a half win team. It's Randy Gregory. That helps make that happen. There it is. I like where your head's at here. I, I want to see a headline at the end of December saying 49ers die by Gregory disease. We are into the fan fiction portion of the yes, podcast. Absolutely. And yeah, it's all about the 49ers. All right, Niner fan, I, I hear you in the comments already. Clickety, 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 clickety. <laughs> all right. Yeah, this is fanciful sports hate stuff. I know it's not very realistic. I got it. But it's fun. It's, it's you know, what we have to hang our hat on at this point for the Niners and that uh, football team. 
Yeah. It, I mean, if you didn't expect a quarter of the show to be Niners hate, then I don't know what you were doing. Clicking on this in the first place. <laughs> it's funny. I just went back and I, I landed on a page that showed our podcast reviews and the one one star rating it was like Niners fan for life. And I, I got to thinking, yeah, we're, we're doing things right. If the one yeah, one exactly. star review that we have is is Niners hate. That's the perfect one star review. You know, you're nailing it at that point. We're doing our job here. Yeah. We're doing our job. Our executive producer is doing their job each and every week. We want to give them thanks. DCH, Rebecca Christensen, Brian Shaw, and of course, JC Schilling. Thanks to our executive producers. The best, man. They uh, they also got a one-star review from that 49ers fan. Yeah, there, there's this new exec, rate the executive producers portion of the internet. Now that Twitter changed to X, people lost their jobs. They created this executive producer rate your executive mm-hmm. producer uh, website and they would have perfect reviews. 99 out of a hundred people give them five star reviews. Somehow one Niners fan got through, uh, gave them each one star review. We're sorry about that, but you know what? Be happy that you're doing your job. Well, just like we are. That's exactly right. It's a badge of honor. People went to get in the flock.com. They're helping to support this podcast. They're the reason why Adam can put a fireplace inside his hobo shack. And we've got Pepper Horton coming in with, you know, a paper check here, Adam. You you, you hear that? This is this is actual paper coming from from Pepper in at one forty five forty four for the year. I didn't realize that Pepper was an octogenarian. <laughs> well, it, it's not a handwritten check. It's one of the ones that oh. I think you can send out through your bank account. So, yeah, Pepper's okay. still uh, a few years short of that anyway. Okay, well, I can't make fun of Pepper at all. Uh, One, because, you know, he's been with us forever. And uh, thanks again, man. Appreciate you as always. And also, I I do pay, I think, three bills that way. See, you know. That's how Mm -hmm. how Pepper pays his uh, yearly podcast bill. Yeah. And it's fun. It's fun when it shows up in the the P.O. box. It's like, oh, hey. Hey. This is cool. (laughs) It's a physical check. There's nothing good in here. Yeah. Yeah, usually it's junk mail. Mm -hmm. Ben Crawl went to getintheflock.com and gave us a raise. $12 to $36 annually. Ben says, hey guys, in belated recognition of the fact that you're producing three times as much content as you were a couple of years ago, I am belatedly tripling my value for value contribution. Don't you dare go up to 15 podcasts a week. You'll bankrupt me. (laughs) I have many ideas, few of which are good. The only brilliant ones are relatively useless things like nicknames for Seahawks players. I would like to share two of them with you and all the flockers. Firstly, last year, while watching the dozens straight game in which DK was double slash triple covered on practically every snap, I realized something. Not only is that dude providing a ton of value and creating single coverage reps for guys like Tyler to exploit, he is still somehow a man without a widespread nickname. Thus, In recognition of the yeoman's labor he does to let his teammates feast, I have begun referring to him as Decoy Metcalf. Anytime I see him run a deep route, sweeping up defensive backs and his gravitational wave like Jupiter collecting moonlets, I just grin. (laughs) There goes Decoy Metcalf. Long may he reign. Secondly, I can't be the only one who felt conflicted about Zach Charbonnet's last name. Charbonnet is fun to say. Flows triplingly off the tongue and all. But come on, he's a badass power back who sends defenders flying like drunks in a Popeye bar fight. And his name's French? This will not do. This simply will not do. But then, <laughs> like but then I like gentlemen, it. I had a hawk epiphany. Zach Charbonnet's name is perfect the way it is. Why? Char Bonnet. Say it with me. First word, Char. Second word, Bonnet. Char Bonnet. Because he plays with his hair on fire. Go Hawks from Ben. Ben, that was uh, that was excellent, man. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, Decoy Metcalf. Uh, that was that was great. Uh, but the thing with, with Charbonnet, right? Like, what's more embarrassing in a bar fight? To get uh, your ass handed to you by some ex-MMA fighter named, you know, Tank? Or... <laughs> 
you know, some guy walks up and says, like, you must, you are going down today, my monsieur. And comes up and just waxes you. Yeah. You know, oh, you just got Chabonet. Are, <laughs> like, are, are we giving Zach a French accent now whenever we, when we're speaking for him? We. Oui. Oui. <laughs> or, or we can give a French accent to all the dudes that he's trucking. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah, that defender, uh, what, two games ago that he gave the shoulder to in the back of the ends of the Panthers uh, defender. It, it basically chucked him out of the crib. Uh, yeah, that guy, as he's going out the back of the end zone, oh, no. <laughs> I'm going to stick with Sharbs, but maybe but maybe thanks to Ben's email here, maybe I go Charbs, and he's just fire. There you go. I don't know that I love the 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 Charbs or the, you know, Charbs. It sounds it's like a little too close to Charmin, soft like toilet paper. Yeah, that's why I'm going ch- with the 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 ch- sound rather than the sh. Or we could tougher. just call him Fire Hat for Charb on it. Or Zach. Big Z. Okay. We'll see what we, we'll see what sticks. I feel like Charbs has been sticking in terms of the right. Yeah, I know. I, I'm not loving it though. I like Ben's better. Charb on it. Michael Paul is in with 112, 19, and our Hawkra cleansing. Where's our Hawkra? We we have a Hawkra cleansing uh, sound here. Oh, Hawkra cleansed. There, there you go, Michael. <laughs> that never gets old. Uh, appreciate it as always, man, Michael. Hope you're staying warm and uh, feeling good down there in uh, San Diego, my man. Also through getintheflock.com, we've got RJ Taylor coming in for the full year at 12-12. So 145-44 for the year. Welcome to the flock to RJ. Hell yeah, man. Good to have you, RJ. Welcome to the Ring of Honor. Uh, Welcome to being part of the coolest group in the whole internet. You're a little flocker now. And I was noticing too, I may be delinquent on sending out emails for the Facebook group. So if you... Mm. Go to getintheflock.com. You sign up at the 1212 level and above. I think it's supposed to give you the link to join, but if it doesn't, send me an email, gohawks at seahawkerspodcast.com, and we will make sure to get you in that Facebook group. We also have the Discord. Everybody in at three bucks a month and above gets into our Discord group. That link I know goes out automatically because I see people join in the Discord, but if you support the show in other ways too, uh, yes, email me and I will get you into our varying communities that we have between Discord and Facebook. And uh, it's a, it's a, either way, it's a great way to spend time online with like-minded Seahawks fans. Heck yeah, man. Uh, the Discord, I believe, is the greatest game day internet gathering that there is. It's tough to beat, that's for sure. Yeah. Tough to beat our group of 1212 supporters and above. We're going to be thanking our members of the flock that uh, help us out uh, here at the end of this week's show. So if you want to get in on that, just join at $12 and above, and we'll thank you on next month's show. And, oh, I was going to say, too, if you want to have your name recognized, uh, for those of you who have been with us for a year or more, you want to send an audio clip to be among the people who voice their own name and location as part of that. All you have to do is record an audio file and send it over to GoHawks at SeahawkersPodcast.com. Heck yeah. I I think those are so much fun. It's a lot like the Monday Night Football where the dudes introduce themselves, you know. So have some fun with it It, like everybody already does. It's uh, it's cool. It gives me a little giggle every time. And speaking of our members of the flock, we've got a message from one of our members of the flock. Liad, who is over in Israel, says, hey, Brandon and Adam. I just want to tell you, I am now serving in the reserve army in Israel. Hamas opened the war on Saturday with a horrific attack on citizens and killed over 1,000 people, including soldiers and young people in a party. The NFL and some teams posted about it on Twitter. I'm very disappointed. Our Seahawks didn't. The people of Israel will never surrender. We are better than them. I'm Israel. Hey. And uh, I just want to say, Liad. Uh, wishing you all the best. And man, does this show the reach of the podcast and the flockers or what when there is a war breaking out and it is one of our members yeah. of the flock over in Israel going to fight? Liad, we're wishing you the best. Uh, dude, Liad, number one, stay safe, my man. Um, sounds like this is going to be, I'd say, a brutal conflict like it's a, uh, 
I mean, in a way, it's a new one, but it's not a new one. Um, right. You know, it's been ongoing, obviously, for ever. And, man, uh, I know some of the tactics that you are up against. And, dude, I'm, I'm worried for you, my man. Um, as far as it being on Twitter or not Twitter, I will uh, I will go back to my old saying. If it happens on Twitter, it doesn't matter. So who cares? So who cares? I, I, I don't care about any of that right now, man. I'm concerned about you and your country and all of that. So uh, best of luck to you, man. Um, yeah, what a wild thing to have to do. I know you were in the Navy, Brandon. Uh, but, I mean, I, you were around combat, but I don't know that you ever uh, had to stick your nose, like, directly into it, yeah? No, not not in this way. No, there were there were times where, I mean, you, you were concerned about uh, world events and that sort of thing, but, gosh, to be on the ground is something totally different. And we carried around Marines who, you know, if there was anything going down, it would be them that we would drop off somewhere. Um, and, and so, yeah, not something that was as concerning as Liad is up against for sure. And so I, there's no good way to transition from this, but we transition from Liad going to war to uh, John Davison, who is just wrapping up his day on the beach and says, well, my last day on the beach <laughs> before flying home by week. And so not a lot of Hawk things going on that I know about, but the big news is happening this weekend and it wouldn't be happening without the podcast. So it's all down to you. On Saturday, myself and Barry are going to London and are attending the game on Sunday. However, we have been invited to stay over with Bloomy and Heather on Saturday night. I imagine the drain will be good, but we'll have to put up with his bleeping Dick Van Dyke impressions. On Sunday, we're all going to the game and meeting with Craig Humphrey and Ross Bell for a few pints beforehand, and then off to Tottenham Hotspur's ground. After the game, we might get another couple of beers, but Barry and I are on the train back to the Northeast, getting home early Sunday morning. We are both looking forward to the game, but the meetup is a podcast reunion, so that makes it special. This, I repeat, would not have happened without the pod, so we all say thank you and go Hawks. Barry just says thank you. Cheers from the Bard. Barry says go Hawks too, he just doesn't know it yet. Like. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the Sam Hallow experience will break him, I think. <laughs> he'll, he'll be on but, board uh, eventually. Yeah, but here's the thing, though. Uh, Dave says that it well, wouldn't have happened without the pod. Okay, sure, 50% true. But the other 50% is it wouldn't have happened without all you guys, man. I mean, that's, you know, you talk about reaching somebody like Leod and his situation right now. And then, you know, when we went out there for the Raiders game, and got to meet all those amazing fellows that he just listed off there. Yeah. Craig and Ross and, you know, Barry and David and Ben Bloomy and all those guys. Uh, just, it was so incredible to think about all of these folks now having connections in like the idea that they're all going to stay together at Bloomies and all that. I'm jealous. <laughs> I almost want to fly out just to crash, but uh, I kind of, you know, I've more or less quit my job. So I can't afford that. Sorry. Yeah, it, there's nothing that uh, has been a better experience as part of doing the show than meeting up with people, whether it was in London for that game, whether it's meeting up you know, down in, you know, going with DCH down to Houston for the 12 12 game that we went to there. Um, yeah, just uh, road games in particular, it's a different kind of experience of, of meeting with folks and fellow fans than it is meeting up at the home stadium. And uh, as good as going to home games is, sometimes those away games are a little more special, too. Yeah, I mean, they all have their own uh, their own special appeal. No yeah. doubt about it. But there's something about, I mean, to kind of continue with the war analogy, I guess. But you're all kind of in the same foxhole, right? The right. enemy territory. And uh, so that's which, kind which of isn't too, like war so. at all as, uh, you know, Leon no, will experience. No, no. Yeah, not even like a, a, a 2%, like no. not even that much, uh, but pretty cool, man. Uh, the idea of the network of little flockers that are out there um, is is really cool. You know, like, I mean, and again, like this last trip, getting recognized on a street corner in Seattle, <laughs> Yeah, you know, by Craig over there in Spokane. Like that's this is wild. 
It's wild. We're just two dudes. We're two dork chops from Montana. Two dork chops. Also getting an email from Scott in Chicago is in says, what are your thoughts on the Marshawn Lynch interview on the club Shay Shay Mm. podcast on YouTube? I found it interesting. Specifically, what are your thoughts on his comments on Russ and him being held on a pedestal when it came to accountability and also on Russ calling Lynch from a blocked number? And we did touch on this a little bit on last show Mm -hmm. because I think it came out the day of recording. But now after a week, maybe had a little bit of time to digest it. I know I was just kind of watching the clips uh, before we recorded the last show. Now I've had time to go back and listen to the whole interview because I can't get enough Marshawn Lynch. I love that Marshawn keep, you know, keeps it as real as he does. And I appreciate everything that, you know, he has to say. And uh, I expected nothing less when he went on um, that podcast with that terrible former Bronco. But yeah, it uh, wasn't surprising really in any way. Was there really anything out of there that you're like, whoa, really? Because not for me, the idea that him and Russ didn't really connect yeah. Shocker. They <laughs> right. couldn't be more different dudes. Initially, when I saw some of the reports and or even heard Marshawn talking about Russ calling from the blocks number, I was thinking somehow like Russ had Marshawn's number in his phone as a block number. And that's why it showed up. But I think when you're a celebrity and you want to block your number from being, uh, you know, showing up on someone else's phone, you just have a blocked number. So it wasn't anything like Russ was blocking uh, Marshawn's number in particular. Um, it was just, it's the Russ calls people from a blocked phone number, which yeah, I suppose is something celebrities do, which I think is weird for Marshawn because like he was saying on the show, he just would have all of his teammates give him a call whenever you need him. And he's that type of guy. And I know what you're saying, just completely different guys. And I think it was demonstrated when Marshawn was talking about that game at te- against Tennessee where Russ didn't have a great game and he was just calling him to say, hey, I got your back, essentially. And mm-hmm. Russ maybe uh, didn't quite understand where Marshawn was coming from. Anyway, it sounded like a disjointed conversation. Marshawn's not going to get into all of it. It sounded like there was probably more detail there, but he has enough respect for Russ that he's not going to you know, go too much into detail. And yeah, like you said, all the other stuff about Russ being held up on a pedestal, I think we'd kind of heard. I think maybe the only detail we got out of that was just that Pete Carroll told the team that anything that needs to be said to Russ goes through him first. Is is that the gist of what I heard? Yeah, something or other like that. I mean, all these guys, when they talk about it, they always talk about it in like these relatively vague terms and you know, they don't want to get into all of it, but obviously they want to get something off their chest or whatever it is. But I I think out of all of the things that came out of that podcast, the thing that was the most disappointing to me was that instance you just talked about where Marshawn calls to be like, don't worry about it, man. Like when you're down, I got you. When I'm down, you got me like, let's roll. Like, you know, we're, we're in this foxhole together basically. And The way that Marshawn was talking, I don't know how you'd get that confused with some other message, but (laughs) clearly Russ did. And then, you know, Sharp looks at him and says, so it was bad. And Marshawn's like, yeah. And then that was kind of it. And that's disappointing because those are those little moments that I think really do bind a team together. And they were going to need those if they were to survive the way that Super Bowl 49 ended. And since they didn't have a bank of those between the leader of the offense and the defense in many ways, I think that was one of the bigger things that led to some of the fraying after that. If you're, if you're a little tighter, you might get through that a little easier. Yeah. I wanted to go back and watch the tape though, at the end of the play that shall not be named and, and see if I can find Marshawn walking off the field Cause he did say he just walked up to Pete's face and burst out laughing in his face. And I don't remember that. That feels like something somebody would have caught on camera because they would have had a camera on Pete Carroll after yeah. that moment. So I, that's one of those things where I feel like, you know, when years go by and it's a big thing like that, like your memory can become, you know, a little fuzzy and you, and you 
think of things in a little different way. I wonder if that's something that when approached by Pete in the locker room after the game or something like that, he just laughed at him and like shook his head or something. Yeah. Like, cause I, I don't recall that happening on the sideline, but I'm not calling Sean a liar or anything like that by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, but, I feel like I would have remembered that if that was, uh, cause yeah. obviously when I think of Sherman's face, I immediately like that camera shot is burned into my brain right now. <laughs> right. Yeah. I can picture Sherm's face right now. Yeah. So I, I feel like that would have been a, a more uh, just as memorable moment, I suppose. Yeah. All these years later, I'm glad that in, in whatever way it does connect both fans and players into this being a terrible moment. And it's, it's like, we all have bad feelings toward it and it sucks. If you can take anything good from it, it's that we all went through this crap together. Yeah, at this point, in a lot of ways, every one of these new interviews that comes out, no matter which player it was or whatever, I feel like it's a bunch of ado about nothing. Like, oh, the defense and Russ didn't really get along? Shocker. Oh, Russ is a little aloof and didn't connect with everybody? Shocker. Oh, Pete Carroll did his best to protect his young quarterback to try to keep him in that positive mindset that he needs to live in to be successful. Shocker. Like, I just, I kind of just don't care anymore. Oh, was it Mar, was Marshawn laughing because he said, Pete said, we'll get him next time. Is that, was that the point in the interview? No, I think that's what Russ said to him. Oh, that was what Russ said. Okay. Yeah. And he just looked at him like, what catfish and planet are you from right now? Which is, which would have been my look too. All right, on to do better and better at life. Thank catfish. God. Well, my do better this week is for a Wall Street Journal writer by the name of Adolfo Flores. And mm. uh, it was, uh, okay, my days of journalism school, th- this is what it took me back to. Because mm. in journalism school, writers get hung up on words. And people who teach and trained journalists are these people that hand down these stupid things that allow journalists to get hung up on stupid words. And where this became evident this past week was uh, with some politician paid almost $20,000 for a lectern. And if you don't know what a lectern is, uh, just think of a podium. And that's what a lectern is because it's that little stand that goes on the podium that people stand behind. It's the exact same thing. <laughs> it's the exact same thing. Or but you have a mic and one doesn't? Whatever. But it don't make no never mind one way or the other. Okay. If you really want to get down to the details and nitpicky of the difference between podium and lectern, like back in the day, a, a podium was just something that you stood on and you know you you spoke from. But there's normally a lectern on a podium because that's the thing that you set your notes on and you talk to mm-hmm. people from. So there's like a a minute difference that I guess used to be there. But even the dictionary says it's the same thing now that a a lectern Mm -hmm. is a podium. Mm -hmm. But within this writing, the journalist shows again, this is if you didn't go through trained journalism course, this, this wouldn't even jump out to you. But this paragraph jumped out to me. It says the scandal dubbed quote unquote, podium gate on social media by those still confused about the difference between a podium and a (laughs) lectern centers on the office's purchase of a seemingly expensive piece of furniture to stand behind while speaking. Hey, Adolfo, there's no confusion here. Normal people call that thing a podium. It's a podium. Stop your uh, journalism school uh, beef that we all go through. It's time to end it now. Adolfo Flores, do better. Adolfo needs to get off of his high podium and come (laughs) down here with the rest of us who are slumming around in the world thinking a lectern and a podium is the same thing because it is. It's technically a lectern. It's technically a lectern. Get out of (laughs) here. Golly. I hate that elitist crap. It feels elitist and it is trained that way and we have to get away from it because normal people... Don't call it a lectern. They call it a podium. Exactly. It's been called a podium forever. So, yeah. So, basically, he can't catch up with the times and then blames everybody else for it. He sounds a lot like me. Here's the thing. There there is an important aspect to journalism school 
that it is important to use the right words for the right things. And yeah, but you can do that without coming across as elitist. And it's that paragraph that I read that comes across as elitist and saying, well, most people don't know the difference between the two. Uh, you just say it's called podium gate because it's what most of us know as a podium. You know, you don't even right. have to go that far. You just call it podium gate. Yeah. Yep. Uh, no, having gone to journalism school as well. Uh, yeah, I know exactly the people and instructors that you are talking about. <laughs> they're the worst. I never did well in their classes. I did. All right. But you know, well, yeah, because you're an overachiever. See when I get, when I get into a class, that's basically 99% bullshit. Catfish! I, I have a hard time caring. And then I don't do well. Oh, that was one of my other favorite things about the Marshawn interview where he was talking about his, the first time he kind of got told by a coach, you know, talking about the way his hair was and the way he dresses. And uh, it was the coach at Cal who said, you know, Marshawn, why do you have to have your hair like that? And your baggy pants. And he, he comes back at the coach, like, because it's who I am. And for another thing, I've got a 3.2 GPA at Cal. Uh, so, and, and I'm yeah. busting my butt for the football team. What more do you want from me? I, I can, I can dress and look how I want. Yeah. And I'm a good dude. So, so why do you care? Yeah. I, I just exactly. thought that for one to have that perspective as a college athlete, I think a lot of college players would be like, Oh yeah. Well, if I want to, I better do what the coach wants to get more playing time. Whereas Marshawn was like, Hey, this is who I am. <laughs> Uh, accept me the way I am or, or not. This is probably my second favorite thing about Mar Marshawn is just that he is so unabashedly who he is. In fact, he probably would call that thing, the lectern or the podium. He'd probably just be like the talking spot or like whatever he wanted to call it. Yeah. And he wouldn't care. He wouldn't take that kind of stuff from Adolfo. Definitely wouldn't. Definitely. Wouldn't. Adolfo would probably want Marshawn to cut his hair. He seems like For that sure. kind of guy. For sure. Well, speaking of another form of elitists and people in power here, Brandon, my do better this week is for the shield for the NFL, for the people in the fines office that have their heads screwed on. So ass backwards. I can't Catfish. believe it. I could not believe this. When I read this on the interwebs, Brandon, that Gino Smith was fined. 10,000 plus fucking dollars for calling out the giants for playing dirty and getting called for taunting. That is un freaking believable. When you put it in contrast to the fact that the dude who did a dirty play and hurt him on the sidelines got fined exactly zero fucking dollars. They care more about the words that hurt people rather than the sticks and stones. They don't even understand child nursery rhymes. This is so absurd, Brandon, that they find somebody for yelling at the sidelines a quarter and a half later rather than a dude who is intentionally trying to hurt somebody on the side and get them out of the game. NFL, pull your head out of your fucking ass. This is one of the most stupid things I've ever seen. Do not come at my quarterback like that ever again. Do better. If they would have not find uh, the, the dude who tackled Gino and not find Gino, everything would have been fine. It's, it's just the fact that they, they find Gino Smith shoot 10 plus. Do, do we have to give them credit that they didn't find Jamal Adams because that was, they came out after the game and they're like, oh yeah, we're considering finding Jamal Adams, uh, who was concussed and not in his right mind, uh, when he was yelling at the official and he, Jamal comes out and issued an apology. And maybe that was a big part of what went into him not getting fined either, but, uh, that would have been a bad look for them too. I, I thought it was a bad look anyway, that they were even considering giving Jamal a fine. My God, my God. The idea that you are going to find a man for the words that come out of his mouth when he literally just sustained a brain injury. Yeah. A brain injury. Like what, what are you doing? Like, do Why you even, you even consider how concussions that? Work? I, I, I just, I don't get it. And then you hear Simmons, the kid that uh, rolled up GMO being like, 
well, what is he complaining about? He doesn't want to get hit, then I guess he should just go down. I don't really understand it. Catfish! You too, dude. Like, oh, at least own up to being an ass. Catfish! That set my hair on fire. I, it, I'm basically right now, this hat, it's a char bonnet. Adam's hat's a char bonnet. Hopefully it doesn't turn char it bonnet. into a hobo hat or else then you're just going to, it's going to escalate this quickly. Yeah, exactly. Then the, now the hobo hat acts more like a chimney, right? The chimney effect. And then your hair burns faster. Uh-huh. Yeah. My better at life this week is for a member of the NFL, a running back for the Indianapolis Colts, Jonathan Taylor, Adam, Jonathan Taylor won. He got a three year, $42 million deal for the Colts. And the Colts are becoming my number two team. I think now in the AFC, Ew. because I don't know, I, I feel like I need a Ew. number two team. Yours is the bills. Uh, and mine used to be the Texans. I, I need somebody to replace that. And who better than a team with a solid running back that decided to, the, they decided to pay him Jonathan Taylor. He wins. And now they've got uh, the Minshew Minshew mania uh, in Indy too. I, I may have to do this. I just want to say to Jonathan Taylor for holding out, getting your money as a running back. You, sir, better at life than skip Bayless. Totally agree with that. Uh, running backs really, really matter. We're seeing it even this season, just how big of a deal it is to have a quality run game. Now, I, I, I need to address this. I'm getting <laughs> off the Texans as my number two team and onto the Colts. Well, I've been off of the Texans. Now, I don't understand why you were ever on the Texans to begin with. That's fine. We'll just let that go. But here's the thing. One, if you're going to have a secondary team, you know, like I do the bills for, for the AFC, you got to stick with it. You got to stick with it. You can't just be a bandwagon secondary, secondary team guy. Then secondly, of all the times in the world to be jumping off the Texans bandwagon and going on the Colts, it's now probably, is when the, you choose it? probably the bad time. Yeah. Cause the, well, the Texans do have clearly the better quarterback in the NFL draft in CJ Stroud than Anthony Richardson. And one of the big reasons they're paying Jonathan Taylor as they can see right now already, Richardson can't finish a game. You better have a dude that can carry the load and keep him out of harm's way. Uh, Richardson might be out for the year, it sounds like. Oh, crap. I just thought it was going to be a few weeks with that AC joint thing. No, there. It, I don't know. People who are reading into it make it sound like it, it could be a whole lot worse. Oh, darn. Well, don't wish that for the kid, but uh, I'm also not surprised with his play style. What are you doing? What are you switching the Colts for? What's wrong with you? Uh, do I need to go over the timeline of what went down with the Texans uh, as to why no, I stopped? No, but if you being... were going to ditch him, why didn't you do it four years I ago? I did ditch it four years like ago. I ditched it when J.J. Watt left, left the team. Oh, then who is your secondary team then? I haven't had one. You're a free agent? Yeah. Okay. And now I kind of, you know, Minshew is, you know, he didn't really get a shot with the Jags and... He was backing up on the Eagles, and plus that was an NFC team. I didn't even need an AFC team. And oh, I get it. You know, I get the Minshew thing, and to be wooed by Gene Shorts, I understand. Yeah, but yeah, <laughs> I I'm in on Minshew. I don't get me wrong, but I, I guess I'll say that maybe over the last few years, it's it my number two has probably been the Ravens. Oh, triple you! But I like Lamar Jackson. I think they, you know, he's exciting. Yeah. yeah. I get it. I always liked Ed Reed. That kind of drew me toward the Ravens. Yeah, get that too. <laughs> it's these little strings that you have to pull to try and decide who your number two uh, team is in the when you're talking about AFC teams. Okay. All right. Well, um, it's been easy for you that. because you were a Bills fan prior to a Seahawks fan, and you just kind of stick with that being your number two. Yeah, because I'm not a wishy washy, you know, fandom waffler. It's your number two team. It doesn't matter. It matters a little. Not really. I don't know. We'll see what the we'll see what the flockers have to say about this. All right. Okay. Uh, my better life I, I kinda, than Skip I, I Bayless. Kind, you know what? I am kind of curious though from the flock how how number two teams are chosen. Like, or do you, are you a, a one fan team and that's it, or do you gravitate to uh, another AFC team from time and again just to just to have a secondary? May, Maybe with people who p play fantasy, maybe they don't need that secondary team. Yeah, because then you're just interested in individual players, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. Hartello not knowing. The little flockers will let us know, though. They'll let us know. 
All right, Brennan, my better at life than Skip Bayless this week is for head coach Pete Carroll because I don't waffle on teams. I don't waffle on my head coach, and he doesn't either. I was so fired up to hear him talk about in his press conference when asked about the Geno Smith hit. And you kind of have to watch it. You can't read the quote. You probably can't just listen to it. You kind of have to watch him on the podium when they ask him about it. And they ask him if he talked to the league regarding how all of it was handled and what needs to go, go down in the future. And he didn't say much. He didn't say much. Uh, it, it was a lot of word salad stuff, and that's all fine because he's just there so he doesn't get fined. But <laughs> at the end of the day, the sense of it that I got from watching him is that he was livid pissed, and he called up the league and chewed somebody's ass. And I love that. I love that our coach is standing up for our players and will go to bat for them no matter what. Old man Pete getting after it for our quarterback, Geno Smith, and taking it to the league better at life than Skip Bayless. Uh, you bring up the the being here so you don't get fined. That was another part of that interview where Marshawn explained uh, where I'm just here so I don't get fined came from. And it turns out it's a really simple answer. Uh, he thought it through and he, well, okay. The story that was funny was that when the league had him on the phone and it was what his, it was the league, uh, his agent, the players association, and they're saying to him and Marshawn's just going off about how he's pissed. Like he doesn't want any part of it. He doesn't want to talk to the media. And they're like, Marshawn, you don't have to talk to the media. You just have to be available to the media. And he's like, yeah, but I don't want to talk to the media. And they're like, Marshawn, listen. And Marshawn's telling the story this way. Marshawn, listen, you just have to be available to the media. And then it clicked in his head. He's like, oh, all right. I just, yeah, okay. <laughs> like he had the epiphany. Like, okay, I just yeah. have to show up. And mm -hmm. then when he had that, because uh, he, he said that Sherm asked him what he was going to do when he goes out there. And he's thinking it through like, oh, yeah, what am what am I going to say? And then he said it came to him that, yeah, he was, he didn't want to get fined, but he had to be there. Thus the line, I'm just here. So I don't get fined. Do you enjoy the, I'm just here. So I don't get fined. Uh, one more or the yeah one. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I think I, I, I enjoy the mm. yeah one more where just every time they ask something, he just looks at him. He's like, yeah. <laughs> Because then you could kind of ask me, and people did. They tried asking things that when he would answer, yeah, it was kind of funny. Uh huh. It's good. It I was an underrated. It goes. It flies under the radar though a little bit because it didn't have the. Uh, it wasn't centered around the Super Bowl. So I right. I mean, the other one too is where he came out with Mike Rob, right? And we kind of we kind of forget about that one. That's true. That's true. I might have to rewatch that one one of these days. Yeah, we'll rewatch it. We will also thank our $12 and above supporters who are in the flock. They went to get in the flock.com. They're helping to support this show. Let's run down the list. Keith Kedover, AKA Flocktimus Prime, University of Cybertron, Little Flockers, Rollout. DCH from Sparks, Nevada, the University of Montana Grizzlies. Eric Trench, rooting for the Seahawks out of Renton, Washington, graduated from Eastern Washington University. Jameson Holman from Murray, Utah, representing Mississippi State University. Hail State and go Hawks. Gary Blum from Chappaqua, New York and the University of Pennsylvania, your 2016 Pick'em League champion. Ron Pepper, UNLV Running Rebels, San Francisco, California. This is Hawk Van Dyke from the beautiful city of London and the capital of the UK. Lisa in Seattle. Samuel Gelber, NoHo, California. David Van Cleve, Camus, Washington, home of the papermakers. Leo Chasse, Ludio, Sweden, from Ludio Eskimos and Ren Coma in front. Paul from San Diego. Aaron Fisher, coming in from Henderson, Nevada, hopefully future resident of the PNW. Chris Boucher, a.k.a. The Biggest Little Flocker, South Central Louisiana State University. Go Mud Dogs. This is J.C. Schilling coming in all the way from Mockenbach, Germany with Hudson and Quinn saying, And go Hawks! Go Hawks! Go Hawks! Go Hawks! 
Hey Seahawkers, my name is Garen Taylor. I live in one of the most beautiful places in the world, North Idaho. Hashtag on the rose. Go Hawks. You heard from executive producers DCH and JC Schilling. Also a big thanks to executive producers Becca Christensen and Brian Shaw. And going down the list, we start with Christina in Manassas, Virginia. Craig in Camas. Sven in Berlin, Deutschland. Jeremy in the Bronx. Jake in Seattle. Tim in Austin. Jonathan in Ridgefield. Jay in Linwood. JC in Horsford, England. Brandon in Huntersville, North Carolina. James in Beaux Arts. Pepper in Greenville, South Carolina. Brian in Berlin, Connecticut. Connie in Gothenburg, Sweden. Tracy in Kaneohe, Hawaii. Kevin in Surrey, BC. Glenn in Ocoee, Florida. Marvin in Riverdale, Utah. Brian in Omak. Dean in the Greater Hockdom. Jeffrey in Kansas City. John C. in the Greater Hockdom. John W. in New York. Dr. G. in League City, Texas. Patrick in Sacramento. Bryson in Eltopia. Kevin in Great Glen, England. Jeremy in Federal Way. Josh in Cander, New York. Ken in Hutto, Texas. Mario in Seattle. Tim in Olympia. Cora in Ditters, Deutschland. Anders in Vila, Denmark. Jeff in Bainbridge Island. Warren in Dundee, Oregon. Chris in Austin. Marlon in the Greater Hockdom. Amy in Squim. Richard in Killeen, Texas. Flopster in Round Rock, Texas. Joseph in Vancouver. Dan in the Greater Hockdom. Corey in Ridgefield. Kyle in the Greater Hockdom. Ryan in Salt Lake City. Joshua in the Greater Hockdom. Norma in the Greater Hockdom. Jamie in Oswestry, England. Rafe in Beaverton, Oregon. DJ in Menifee, California. Eugene in Henderson, Nevada. Terrence in Dallas. Spooty Poo in Olympia. Jason in Panama City, Florida. BB in Oakland. Bridget in Redmond. Daniel in Post Falls, Idaho. Jeff in Gilbert, Arizona. Ryan in Crestview, Florida. Kayla in Vancouver. Tanner in Kalispell, Montana. Ryan in Fairbanks. Alexander in Oranienburg, Denmark. Sean in Cascade, Iowa via Kalispell, Montana. Jason in Portland. Gordon in Valdez, Alaska. Ovary Smasher 69 in Phoenix, Arizona. Daniel in Swindon, England. Daniel C. in the Greater Hockdom. Oliver in Fort St. John, B.C. Eric in Kalispell, Montana. Ian in Seattle. B. Walls 22 in New York. Corey in Robertson, Australia. Jay in Fairbanks. Russell in Harpenden, England. Sam in Alamante Springs, Florida. Chris in Manchester, England. Logan in Evansville, Indiana. Nathan in Fife. Charles in Spokane. Adrian in Squim. Jonathan in Newmarket, England. Ranger Luke in Olathe, Kansas. Mike in Kelowna, BC. Edward in the Greater Hockdom. Freddie in Longview. Ken in Stanwood. RJ in Busiris, Kansas. The Poetrist in Boise, Idaho. Stu in Navarre, Florida. Kelsey in Olympia. Marty in Melbourne, Australia. Gareth in Chester, England. Chris in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Randy in Silverton, Oregon. John in Waco, Nebraska. And Martin in Ferrum, Denmark. A big thanks to all of our supporters at 12 and above. A big thanks to all of our supporters. You are helping to make this show going strong into year 10, right? Yeah. <laughs> you lose track after double digits. 11. I think this is year 11 we're doing now. Right. Yeah. Yes, we've, we've gone yeah. beyond 10. We're now on year 11. Yeah. And you've put up with me for that long well, even since kindergarten, I don't know how you do it, man. You're a, you're a saint. But one of the most exciting things about the potential of beating the Bengals here, Brandon, uh -huh. is that we'll have beat the Lions, we'll have beat the Panthers, we'll have beat the Bengals. I think that's spanking all the kitties. We'll have spanked all the kitties. They've been spanked, and then we'll be then we'll be good. Oh, only one more team left, though, the Jacksonville oh, Jaguars. No. Oh, we don't play them though, dude. Super Bowl. Super Bowl against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Oh, Seattle, Jacksonville. Spank the kitty Super Bowl. You hear it, heard it here first. We're going to have the quadrectra. That's a word. Look it up. I'm spanking the kitty. And I think with that, there's only one thing left to say. Go Hawks.
Go Hawks. 